Track 37. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Len Holster, making a smokestack Jones. Track 37. The story continued by Isidore Octavio Baldessari Fosco, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Brazen Crown, Perpetual Archmaster of the Rosicrucian Masons of Mesopotamia, attached in honorary capacities to societies musical, societies medical, societies philosophical, the societies general benevolent throughout Europe, etc., etc., etc. The Count's Narrative in the summer of 1850 I arrived in England, charged with a delicate political mission from abroad. Confidential persons were semi-officially connected with me, whose exertions I was authorized to direct, Monsieur and Madame Rubel being among the number. Some weeks of spare time were at my disposal before I entered on my functions by establishing myself in the suburbs of London. Curiosity may stop here to ask for some explanation of those functions on my part. I entirely sympathize with the request. I also regret that diplomatic reserve forbids me to comply with it. I arranged to pass the preliminary period of repose to which I have just referred in the superb mansion of my late lamented friend, Sir Percival Glyde. He arrived from the continent with his wife. I arrived from the continent with the mine. England is the land of domestic happiness. How appropriately we entered it under these domestic circumstances. The bond of friendship which united Percival and myself was strengthened on this occasion by a touching similarity in the pecuniary position on his side and on mine. We both wanted money. Immense necessity. Universal want. Is there a civilized human being who does not feel for us? How insensible must that man be? Or how rich? I enter into no sordid particulars in discussing this part of the subject. My mind recoils from them. With a Roman austerity I show my empty purse and Percival's to the shrinking public gaze. Let us allow the deplorable fact to assert itself once and for all in that manner and pass on. We were received at the mansion by the magnificent creature who is inscribed on my heart as Marion, who is known in the colder atmosphere of society as Miss Halcombe. Just heaven! With that inconceivable rapidity, I learned to adore that woman. At sixty, I worshipped her with the volcanic ardor of eighteen. All of the gold from my rich nature was poured hopelessly at her feet. My wife, poor angel, my wife who adores me, got nothing but the shillings and the pennies. Such is the world, such a man, such a love. What are we, I ask, but puppets in a show-box? Oh, how many potent destiny! Pull our strings gently, dance us mercifully off our miserable little stage. The preceding lines, rightly understood, express an entire system of philosophy. It is mine. I resume. The domestic position at the commencement of our residence at Blackwater Park has been drawn with amazing accuracy, with the profound mental insight, by the hand of Marion herself. Pass me the intoxicating familiarity of mentioning this sublime creature by her Christian name. Accurate the knowledge of the contents of her journal, to which I obtained access by a clandestine means unspeakably precious to me in the remembrance, warns my eager pen from topics which this essentially exhaustive woman has already made her own. The interests, interests breathless and immense, with which I am here concerned, begin with the deplorable calamity of Marion's illness. The situation at this period was emphatically a serious one. Large sums of money, due at a certain time, were wanted by Percival, I say nothing of the modicum equally necessary to myself, and the one source to look to for supplying them was the fortune of his wife, of which was not one farthing was at his disposal until her death. 
bad so far, and worse still farther on. My lamented friend had private troubles of his own, to which the delicacy of my disinterested attachment to him forbade me from inquiring too curiously. I knew nothing but what a woman named Anne Catherick was hidden in the neighborhood, that she was in communication with the Lady Glyde, and that the disclosure of a secret, which would be the certain ruin of Percival, might be the result. He had told me himself that he was a lost man unless his wife was silenced and unless the Anne Catherick was found. If he was a lost man, what would become of our pecuniary interests? Curious as I am by nature, I absolutely trembled at the idea. The whole force of my intelligence was now directed at the finding of Anne Catherick. Our money affairs, important as they were, admitted of delay but the necessity of discovering this woman emitted of none. I only knew her by description as a pretending and extraordinary personal resemblance to Lady Glyde. The statement of this curious fact, intended merely to assist me in my identifying the person of whom we were in search, when coupled with the additional information that Anne Catherick had escaped from a madhouse, started the first immense conception in my mind, which subsequently led to such amazing results. That conception involved nothing less than the complete transformation of two separate identities. Lady Glyde and Anna Catherick were to change names, places, and destinies, the one with the other. The prodigious consequences contemplated by the change being the gain of thirty thousand pounds and the eternal preservation of Sir Percival's secret. My instincts, which seldom err, suggested to me, on reviewing the circumstances that our invisible Anne would sooner or later return to the boat house at the Blackwater Lake. There I posted myself, previously mentioning to Mrs. Michelson, the housekeeper, that I might be found when wanted immersed in study in that solitary place. It is a my rule never to make unnecessary mysteries, and never to set people suspecting me for want of a little seasonable candor on my part. Mrs. Michelson believed in me from first to last. This ladylike person, widow of a Protestant priest, overflowed with faith, touched by such superfluity of simple confidence in a woman of her mature years, I opened the ample reservoirs of my nature and absorbed it all. I was rewarded for posting myself sentinel of the lake by the appearance, not of Anne Catherick herself, but of the person in charge of her. This individual also overflowed with simple faith, which I absorbed in myself, as in the case already mentioned. I leave her to describe the circumstances, if she has not done so already, under which she introduced me to the object of her maternal care. When I first saw Anne Catherick, she was asleep. I was electrified by the likeness between this unhappy woman and Lady Glyde. The details of the grand scheme which had suggested themselves in outline only up to that period occurred to me in all their masterly combination at the sight of the sleeping face. At the same time, my heart, always accessible to tender influence, dissolved in tears at the spectacle of suffering before me. I instantly set myself to impart relief. In other words, I, I provided the necessary stimulant for strengthening and Catholic to perform the journey to London. The best years of my life had been passed in the ardent study of the mechanical and uh, chemical science. Chemistry especially has always had irresistible attractions for me from the enormous, the illimitable uh, power of the knowledge of it confers. Chemists, I asserted emphatically, might sway, if they please, the destinies of humanity. Let me explain this before I go further. Mind, they say, rules the world. But what rules the mind? The body, follow me closely here, lies at the mercy of the most omnipotent of all potentates, the chemist. Give me Fosco, chemistry. And when Shakespeare had conceived the Hamlet and sits down to execute the conception with a few grains of powder dropped into his daily food, I will reduce his mind by the action of his body until his pen pours out the most abject drivel that has ever degraded paper. Under similar circumstances, revive me the illustrious Newton. I guarantee when he sees the apple fall, he shall eat it instead of discovering the principle of gravitation. 
Nero's dinner shall transform Nero into the mildest of men before he is done digesting it. And the morning draught of Alexander the Great shall make Alexander run for his life, the first sign of the enemy this same afternoon. On my sacred word of honor, it was lucky for society that the modern chemists are, by incomprehensible good fortune, the most harmless of mankind. The mass are worthy fathers of families who keep shops. The few our philosophers besotted with admiration for the sound of their own lecturing voices, visionaries who waste their lives on fantastic impossibilities, or quacks whose ambition soars no higher than our corns. The society escapes, and the illimitable power of a chemistry remains the slave at the most superficial and the most insignificant ends. Why this outburst? Why this withering eloquence? because my conduct has been misrepresented because my motives have been misunderstood it has been assumed that i used my vast chemical resources against the anne catholic that i would have used them if i could against the magnificent marion herself odious oh, insinuations of both all of my interests were concerned as will be seen presently in the preservation of anne catholic's life all of my anxieties were concentrated on Marion's rescue from the hands of the licensed imbecile who attended her, and who found my advice confirmed from the first to the last by the physicians from London. On two occasions only, both equally harmless to the individual on whom I practice, did I summon to myself the assistance of chemical knowledge. In the first of the two, after following Marion to the inn at the Blackwater, studying behind a convenient wagon, which hid me from her the poetry of motion as embroidered in her walk, I availed myself to the services of my invaluable wife to copy one and to intercept the other of two letters which my adorned enemy had entrusted to a discarded maid. In this case, the letters being in the bosom of the girl's dress, Madame Fosco would only open them, read them, perform her instructions, seal them, and put them back again by scientific assistance, which assistance I rendered in a half-ounce bottle. The second occasion, when the same means were employed, was the occasion to which I shall soon refer of Lady Glyde's arrival in London. Never at any other time was I indebted to my art as distinguished from myself. To all other emergencies and complications, my natural capacity for grappling single-handed with circumstances was invariably equal. I affirm all pervading intelligence of that capacity. At the expense of the chemist, I vindicate the man. Respect this outburst of generous indignation. It has inexpressibly relieved me. And Ruth, let us proceed. Having suggested to Mrs. Clement, or Clements, I'm not sure which, that the best method of keeping Anne out of Percival's reach was to remove her to London, having found that my proposal was eagerly received, and having appointed a day to meet the travellers at the station, and to see them leave it, I was at liberty to return to the house, and to confront the difficulties which still remained to be met. My first proceeding was to avail myself of the sublime devotion of my wife. I had arranged with Mrs. Clements that she should communicate her London address in Anne's interest to Lady Glyde, but this was not enough. Designing persons in my absence might shake the simple confidence of Mrs. Clements, as she might not write after all. Who, by, and if privately seeing her home, I asked myself this question. The conjugal part of me immediately answered, Madame Fosco. After deciding on my wife's mission to London, I arranged that the journey should serve a double purpose. A nurse for the suffering Marion, equally devoted to the patient and to myself, was a necessity of my position. One of the most eminently confidential and capable women in existence was by good fortune at my disposal. I referred to that respectable matron, Madame Rubel whom I addressed at a letter, a residence in London, by the hands of my wife. On the appointed day, Mrs. Clemens and Anne Catherick met me at the station. I politely saw them off. I politely saw Madame Fosco off by the same train. 
The last thing at night, my wife returned to Blackwater, having followed her instructions with the most unimpeachable accuracy. She was accompanied by Madame Rubel, and she brought me the London address of Mrs. Clemens. After events proved that this last precaution to have been unnecessary, Mrs. Clemens punctually informed Lady Glyde of her place of abode. With a wary eye on future emergencies, I kept the letter. The same day I had a brief interview with the doctor, at which I protested in the sacred interest of humanity against his treatment of Marion's case. He was insolent, as all ignorant people are. I showed no resentment. I deferred quarrelling with him until it was necessary to quarrel to some purpose. My next proceeding was to leave Blackwater myself. I also had a little business of the domestic sort to transact with Mr. Frederick Fairley. I found the house I wanted in St. John's Wood. I found Mr. Fairley at Limeridge, Cumberland. My own private familiarity with the nature of Marion's correspondence had previously informed me that she had written to Mr. Fairley, proposing, as a relief to Lady Glyde's matrimonial embarrassments, to take her on a visit to her uncle in Cumberland. This letter I had wisely allowed to reach its destination, feeling at the time that it would do no harm and might do good. I now presented myself before Mr. Fairley to support Marion's own proposal, with certain modifications which, happily for the success of my plans, were rendered really inevitable by her illness. It was necessary that Lady Glyde should leave Blackwater alone by her uncle's invitation, and that she should rest the night at the journey at her aunt's house, the house I had in St. John's Wood, by her uncle's express advice. To achieve these results, and to secure a note of invitation which could be shown to Lady Glyde, were the objects of my visit to Mr. Ferry. What I have mentioned, this uh, gentleman was equally feeble in mind and body, and that I let loose the whole force of my character on him, I have said enough. I came, I saw, and conquered Farley. On my return to Blackwater Park with the letter of invitation, I found the doctor's imbecile treatment of Marion's case had led to the most alarming results. The fever had turned to typhus. Lady Glyde, on the day of my return, tried to force herself into the room to nurse her sister. She and I had no affinities of sympathy. She had committed the unpardonable outrage of my sensibilities of calling me a spy. She was a stumbling block in my way and in Percival's, but, for all that, my magnanimity forbade me to put her in danger of infection with my own hand. At the same time, I offered no hindrance on putting herself in danger. If she had succeeded in doing so, the intricate knot which I was slowly and patiently operating on might perhaps have been cut by circumstances. As it was, the doctor interfered and she was kept out of the room. I had myself previously recommended sending for advice to London. This course had now been taken. The physician, on his arrival, confirmed my view of the case. The crisis was serious, but we had hope on our charming patient on the fifth day from the appearance of the typhus. I was only once absent from Blackwater at this time, when I went to London by the morning train to make the final arrangements at my house in St. John's Wood, to assure myself by private inquiry that Mrs. Clements had not moved, and to settle one or two little preliminary matters with her husband of Madame Rubel. I returned at night. Five days afterwards, the physicians pronounced our interesting Marion to be all out of danger and to be in need of nothing but careful nursing. This was the time I had waited for. Now that the medical attendance was no longer indispensable, I played the first move in the game by asserting myself against the doctor. He was one among many witnesses in my way whom it was necessary to remove. A lively altercation between us, in which Percival, previously instructed by me, refused to interfere, served the purpose in view. I descended upon the miserable man in an irresistible avalanche of indignation and swept him from the house.
The servants were the next encumbrances to get rid of. Again I instructed Percival, whose moral courage required my perpetual stimulants, and Mrs. Michelson was amazed one day by hearing from her master that the establishment was to be broken up. We cleared the house of all the servants but one who was kept for domestic purposes, and whose lumpish stupidity we could trust to make no embarrassing discoveries. When they were gone, nothing remained but to relieve ourselves of Mrs. Michelson a result which was easily achieved by sending this amiable lady to find lodgings for her mistress at the seaside. The circumstances were now exactly where they were required to be. Lady Glyde was confined to her room by a nervous illness, and the lumpish housemaid, I forget her name, was shut up there at night in attendance on her mistress. Marian, though fast recovering, still kept her bed with Mrs. Robert for nurse, no other living creatures but my wife and myself and Percival were in the house. With all the chances thus in our favor, I confronted the next emergency and played the second move in the game. The object of the second move was to induce Lady Glyde to leave Blackwater unaccompanied by her sister. Unless we could have persuaded her that Marion had gone on to Cumberland first, there was no chance of removing her of her own free will from the house. To produce this necessary operation in her mind, we concealed our interesting invalid in one of those uninhabited bedrooms in the Blackwater. At the dead of night, Madame Fosco, Madame Robert, and myself, Percival not being cool enough to be trusted, accompanied the concealment. The scene was picturesque, mysterious, dramatic the highest degree. By my directions the bed had been made in the morning on a strong movable framework of wood. We had only to lift the framework gently at the head and foot and to transport our patient where we pleased without disturbing herself or their bed. No chemical assistance was needed or used in this case. Our interesting Marion lay in a deeper repose of convalescence. We placed the candles and opened the doors beforehand. I, in right of my great personal strength, took the head of the framework. My wife and Madame Rebel took the foot. I bore my share of that inestimably precious burden with the manly tenderness, with the fatherly care. Where is the modern Rembrandt who could depict our midnight procession? Alas for the arts, alas for this most pictorial of subjects. The modern Rembrandt is nowhere to be found. The next morning my wife and I started for London, leaving Marion secluded, and in the uninhabited middle of the house, under the care of Madame Rouvel, who kindly consented to imprison herself with her patient for two or three days. Before taking our departure I gave Percival Mr. Farley's letter of invitation to his niece, instructing her to sleep on the journey to Cumberland at her aunt's house, with directions to show it to Lady Glyde on hearing from me. I also obtained from him the address of the asylum in which Anne Catherick had been confined, and a letter to the proprietor announcing to that gentleman the return of his runaway patient to medical care. I had arranged at my last visit to the metropolis to have our modest domestic establishment ready to receive us when we arrived in London by the early train. In the consequence of this wise precaution, we were enabled that same day to play the third move in the game the getting possession of Anne Catherick. Dates are important here. I combine in myself the opposite characteristics of a man of sentiment and a man of business. I have all the dates at my fingers' ends. On a Wednesday, the 24th of July, 1850, I sent to my wife in a cab to clear Mrs. Clemens out of the way in the, the first place. I suppose the message from Lady Glyde in London was sufficient to obtain this result. Mrs. Clements was taken away in the cab and was left in the cab while my wife, on pretense of purchasing something at a shop, gave her the slip and returned to receive her expected visitor at our house in St. John Woods. It was hardly necessary to add that the visitor had been described to the servants as Lady Glyde. 
In the meantime, I had followed another cap, with a note for Anne Catherick merely mentioning that Lady Glyde intended to keep Mrs. Clemens to spend the day with her, and that she was to join them under care of a good gentleman waiting outside, who had already saved her from discovery in Hampshire by Sir Percival. The good gentleman sent in this note by street boy, and paused for results at door or two farther on. At the moment when Anne appeared at the house door and closed it, this excellent man had the cab door open, ready for her, absorbed her into the vehicle, and drove off. Pass me here one exclamation in parentheses of how interesting this is. On the way to Forest Road, my companion showed no fear. I can be paternal, no man more so, when I please, and I was intensely paternal on this occasion. What the titles I had to her confidence! I had compounded the medicine which had done her good. I had warned her of her danger from a Sir Percival. As perhaps I trusted too implicitly to these titles, perhaps I underrated the keenness of the lower instances in persons of weak intellect, it is certain that I neglected to prepare her sufficiently for a little disappointment upon entering my house. When I took her into the drawing-room, uh, she saw no one present but the Madame Fosco, who was a stranger to her. She exhibited the most violent agitation. If she had scented the danger in the air as a dog scents the presence of some creature unseen, her alarm could not have displayed itself more suddenly and more cautiously. I interposed in vain. The fear from which she was suffering I might have soothed, but the serious heart disease under which she labored was beyond the reach of all moral palliatives. To my unspeakable horror, she was seized with convulsions, a shock to the system, in her condition, which might have laid her dead at any moment at our feet. The nearest doctor was sent for, and was told that Lady Glyde required his immediate services. To my infinite relief, he was a capable man. I represented my visitor to him as a person of weak intellect and subject to delusions, and I arranged that no nurse but my wife should watch in the sick room. This unhappy woman was too ill, however, to cause any anxiety about what she might say. The one dread which now oppressed me was the dread that the false Lady Glyde might die before the true Lady Glyde arrived in London. I had written a note in the morning to Madame Rubel, uh, telling her to join me at her husband's house on the evening of Friday the 26th, with another note to Percival, warning him to show his wife her uncle's letter of invitation, to assert that her marriage had gone on before her, and to dispatch her to town by the midday train on the 26th also. On reflection, I had felt the necessity, in Anne Catholic's state of health, of precipitating events, and of having Lady Glyde at my disposal earlier than I had originally contemplated. What fresh directions in the terrible uncertainty of my position could I now issue? I could do nothing but trust to chance and the doctor. My emotions expressed themselves in pathetic apostrophes, which I was just self-possessed enough to couple in the hearing of other people with the name of Lady Glyde. In all other respects, Fosco, on that memorable day, was Fosco shrouded in total eclipse. She passed a bad night. She woke worn out, but later in the day she revived amazingly. My elastic spirits revived with her. I could receive no answers from Percival or Madame Rubel until the morning of the next day, the 26th, in anticipation of their following my directions, which accident apart, I knew they would do, I went to secure a fly to fetch Lady Glyde from the railway, directing it to be at my house on the 26th at 2 o'clock. After seeing the order entered in the book, I went on to arrange matters with Monsieur Burbel. I also procured the services of two gentlemen who could furnish me with the necessary certificates of a lunacy. One of them I knew personally, the other was known to Monsieur Rubel. Both were men whose vigorous minds soared superior to narrow scruples. Both were laboring under temporary embarrassments. Both believed in me. It was past five o'clock in the afternoon before I returned from the performance of these duties. When I got back, Anne Catherick was dead. Dead on the 25th. 
and Lady Glyde was not to arrive in London until the 26th. I was stunned. Meditate on that. Fosco stunned. It was too late to retrace our steps. Before my return, the doctor had officiously undertaken to save me all trouble by registering the death on the date when it happened with his own hand. My grand scheme, unassailable here, though, had its weaker place now. No efforts on my part could alter the fatal event of the 25th. I turned manfully to the future. Percival's interest and mine being still at stake, nothing was left but to play the game through to the end. I recalled my impenetrable calm and played it. On the morning of the 26th, Percival's letter reached me, announcing his wife's arrival by the midday train. Madame Rubel also wrote to say she would follow in the evening. I started in the fly leaving the false Lady Glyde dead in the house to receive the true Lady Glyde on her arrival by the railway at three o'clock. Hidden under the seat of the carriage, I carried with me all the clothes that Aunt Catherick had worn on coming unto my house. They were destined to assist the resurrection of the woman who was dead in the person of the woman who was living. What a situation! I suggest it to the rising romance writers of England. I offer it as totally new to the worn-out dramatists of France. Lady Glyde was at the station. There was a great crowding and confusion, and more delay than I liked in case any of her friends had happened to be on the spot in reclaiming her luggage. Her first questions, as we drove off, implored me to tell her news of her sister. I invented news of the most pacifying kind, assuring her that she was about to see her sister at the, my house. My house, on this occasion only, was in the neighborhood of Leicester Square, and was in the occupation of Monsieur Robert, who received us in the hall. I took my visitor upstairs into the back room, the two medical gentlemen being there in waiting on the floor beneath to see the patient and to give me their certificates. After quieting Lady Glyde by the necessary assurances about her sister, I introduced my friend separately to her presence. They performed the formalities of education briefly, intelligently, conscientiously. I entered the room again as soon as they had left it, and at once precipitated events by a reference of the alarming card to Miss Halcombe's state of health. Results followed as I had anticipated. Lady Glyde became frightened and turned faint. For the second time and the last I called science to my assistance. A medicated glass of water and a medicated bottle of smelling salts relieved her of all further embarrassment and alarm. Additional applications later in the evening procured her the inestimable blessing of a good night's rest. Madame Rubel arrived in time to preside at Lady Glyde's toilet. Her own clothes were taken away from her at night, and Anne Catherick's were put on her in the morning, with the strict disregard to propriety by the matronly hands of the good Rubel. Throughout the day I kept our patient in a state of partially suspended to consciousness until the dexterous assistance of my medical friends enabled me to procure the necessary order rather earlier than I had ventured to hope. That evening, the evening of the 27th, Madame Rubel and I took our revived Anne Catholic to the asylum. She was received with great surprise, but without suspicion, thanks to the order and certificates to Percival's letter to that likeness to the clothes and to the patient's own confused mental condition at the time. I returned at once to assist Madame Fosco in the preparations for the burial of the false Lady Glyde, having the clothes and luggage of the true Lady Glyde in my possession. They were afterwards sent to Cumberland by the conveyance which was used for the funeral. I attended the funeral with becoming dignity attired in the deepest mourning. My narrative of these remarkable events, written under equally remarkable circumstances, closes here. The minor precautions which I observed in communicating with the Limeridge House were already known, so it is the magnificent success of my enterprise. So are the solid pecuniary results which followed it. I have to assert, 
with the whole force of my conviction that the one weak place in my scheme would never have been found out if the one weak place in my heart had not been discovered first. Nothing but my fatal admiration for Marion restrained me from stepping into my own rescue when she effected her sister's escape. I ran the risk, and trusted in the complete destruction of Lady Glyde's identity. If either Marion or Mr. Hartwright attempted to assert their identity, they would publicly expose themselves to the imputation of sustaining a rank deception they would be distrusted and discredited accordingly, and they would therefore be powerless to place my interest or Percival's secret in jeopardy. I committed one error in trusting myself to such a blindfold calculation of chances as these. I committed another when Percival had paid the penalty of his own obstinacy and violence by granting Lady Glyde a second reprieve from her the madhouse, and allowing Mr. Hartwright a second chance of escaping me. In brief, Fosco, at this serious crisis, was untrue to himself. Deplorable and uncharacteristic fault. Behold the cause. In my heart, behold, in the image of Marian Halcombe, the first and last witness of Fosco's life. At the ripe age of sixty, I make this unparalleled confession. Youths, I invoke your sympathy. Maidens, I claim your tears. A word more, and the attention of the reader, concentrated breathlessly on myself, shall be released. My own mental insight informs me that there are three inevitable questions will be asked by persons of inquiring minds. They shall be stated, they shall be answered. First question. What is the secret of Madame Fosco's unhesitating devotion of herself to the fulfillment of my boldest wishes, to the furtherance of my deepest plans. I might answer this by simply referring to my own character, and by asking in my turn where, in the history of the world, has a man of my order ever been found without a woman in the background, self-immolated on the altar of his life. But I remember that I am writing in England, I remember that I was married in England, and I ask if a woman's marriage obligations to in this country provide for her private opinion of her husband's principles? No! They charge her undisturbingly to love, honor, and obey him. That is exactly what my wife has done. I stand here in a supreme moral elevation, and I loftily assert her accurate performance of her conjugal duties. Silence, Calumet. Your sympathy, wives of England, for Madame Fosco. Second question. If Anne Catherick had not died when she did, what should I have done? I should, in that case, have asserted worn-out nature and finding permanent repose. I should have opened the doors of the prison of life, and have extended to the captive incurably afflicted mind and body both a happy release. Third question. In a calm revision of all the circumstances, is my conduct worthy of any serious blame? Most emphatically, no. I have not carefully avoided exposing myself to the odium of committing unnecessary crime. With my vast resources in chemistry, I might have taken Lady Glyde's life. At immense personal sacrifice, I followed the dictates of my own ingenuity, my own humanity, my own caution, and took her identity instead. Judge me what I might have done, how comparably innocent, how indirectly virtuous I appear in what I really did. I announced on beginning that this narrative would be a remarkable a document. It has entirely answered my expectations. Receive these fervid lines, my last legacy to the country I live forever. They are worthy of the occasion and worthy of Fosco. End of track 37.